ವಕ್ರತುಂಡ ಮಹಾಕಾಯ ಸೂರ್ಯಕೋಟಿ ಸಮಪ್ರಭ ನಿರ್ವಿಘ್ನ ಕುರು ಮೇ ದೇವ ಸರ್ವಕಾರ್ಯು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯ ಪರದೇ ಕಾಮಿಣಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಂಭಂ ಕರಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸಿದ್ಧೇರ್ಭವತು ಮೇ ಸದಾ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನಕಲ್ಯಾಣ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ವರ ಮೂಕಂ ಕರೋತಿ ಪಾಚಾಳ ಪಂಗು ಲಂಘಯತೆ ಗಿರಿ ಯತ್ಕೃಪಾತಮಹಂ ವಂದೇ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಮಾಧವ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಮಾಧವ ವಿಲ್ ರೀಡ್ ನೌ from verse number 48 so turn your pages to verse number 48 we will read 48 49 and 50 yogastah kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddhya siddhyo samo bhutva samatvam yoga uchyate ದೂರೇಣ ಹ್ಯವರ ಕರ್ಮ ಬುದ್ಧಿಯೋಗಾಧನಂಜಯ ಬುದ್ಧೌ ಶರಣಮನ್ವಿಕ್ಷ ಕೃಪಣ ಫಲ ಹೇತವ ಬುದ್ಧಿಯುಕ್ತೋ ಜಹಾತೀಹ ಉಭೇ ಸುಕೃತ ದುಷ್ಕೃತೆ ತಸ್ಮಾದ್ ಯೋಗಾಯ ಯುಜಸ್ವ ಯೋಗ ಕರ್ಮ ಸು ಕೌಶಲ So last week we saw two beautiful definitions of yoga. Yoga means union with the divine. What does it mean? So we are in the topic of karma yoga. And at first Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna, you have the right to karma yoga. Right now, the quality of your mind, the way it is, it's meant for karma yoga at this point in time because when shri krishna gave jnana yoga arjuna wasn't able to absorb it so he says now you are qualified to do karma yoga and we studied how to do karma yoga with that dip formula d for dedicate all actions to god i be an instrument and b accept everything as prasad and when we are able to do this and all three are required we can't just do one we can't just you know dedicate everything to god but still insist that results come a certain way or we cannot ha- engage in selfish action but be you know let go of results and be equanimous that actually doesn't happen it doesn't work so and we can't dedicate to god and accept everything as prasad and not be an instrument not see ourselves as the servant of god the idea of this whole karma yoga is to convert ego what we call this ego this ahankara this notion of i me mine to con- convert this ego into sego to become a servant of god that's the whole idea of karma yoga so these three have to come together to form that action and when we do 
the action with this attitude, with this DIP or dip attitude, what happens is samatvam. We can attain equanimity of mind. We can expect to be equanimous only when we have done all of these things fully. And uh, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, he's trying to, you know, make Arjuna really want to do karma yoga. He's trying to sort of praise karma yoga. So he says karma is very far fetched from karma yoga. In karma, there's, or karma in regular action, there's a lot of agitation. There's a lot of selfishness. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of things going on. But in karma yoga, in the beginning itself, your goal, your ideal is something much higher. And therefore, because it is much higher, you are working out of inspiration. And in the middle, you're focused on the process. And you're just in the moment. And at the end, you have the sense of equanimity. So he says that this karma yoga is far-fetched from karma. So why engage in karma? Why not just do karma yoga? And you don't have to change your action. Nobody's saying change your job, change your you know, duty, change where you are, change location. All that Lord Krishna is saying, change the attitude. That's why it's called yoga buddhi. It's an attitude. Change your attitude wherever you are. And that is called yoga. That's called karma yoga. Nothing else has to change. And further, he says, the beauty about this karma yoga is, it is, or the definition of this karma yoga is ka yoga karma sukoshanam. It is skill in action. What is the skill here in karma yoga? The skill is that we perform action without getting bound by it. That is called skill in action. This is an addition, of course, to one being very skilled and one bringing a great change or a great output to society because they're so focused on their act. But it's really getting into the action without getting bound. Because action has a binding nature. Action has this nature where it can take away all of our time. It can take away all of our time. It can take away all of our attention. It can make us want, want, want even more. It can make us obsessed with the results. It can make us keep going and going and going and not stop. It can keep pushing us into the world. It can increase our cravings. It can increase our vasanas. Action has the potency to do all of this. And Lord Krishna says, get into action. And we're like, what? It does all of these things. Why are you telling me to get into action? Because there's a way to do it without getting bound. And that is the kushalata. That's the skill. You see, we're all here to exhaust our vasanas pretty much. And this is what Gurudev says again and again, right? Every day, what are we doing? What are we doing? We are just seeking happiness. We are seeking some kind of paltry pleasure. Let me get this. Let me get that. And why does something make us happy? It's because it matches our vasanas. So maybe for some people, classical music would make them very happy. For others, rock music. For others, silence. Because what makes us happy is according to our vasanas. So every day, we're just pursuing our vasanas. We're just pursuing our vasanas. And so there are two ways. where We're helplessly pulled towards our vasanas. It's, it's a natural thing. We're helplessly pulled. Either we increase our vasanas or we exhaust them. So if we get into action just regularly, we actually increase these vasanas, increase these cravings, likes and dislikes, and we get pushed out into the world again and again. But if we start to exhaust them, exhaust them how? By going through them selflessly. Again, that dip formula, going through them selflessly, then what happens is they actually end up liberating us. Those vasanas don't get stronger. We don't get enmeshed in them. So this is skill in action. 
how to get into the action, how to perform it fully, wholly, completely, perfectly, as perfect as we can, but not getting bound. That is skill. And that's not easy to do. <laughs> it's very hard, right? Because when we get totally into action, there's that tendency to want things to happen, but to get in and be completely untouched by it. That is the glory of Karma Yoga. So now he's going to say some very, very beautiful verses. So he's going to say, what happens to those who engage in Karma? What happens to them? How do they grow? How do they develop? So this is the theme of the verses that we're seeing today. Okay? So verse number 51. Karma jam buddhi yukta hi Karma jam buddhi yukta hi Phalam tyaktva mani shenaha Palam tyaktva manishinaha Janma bandhavi nir muktaha Janma bandhavi nir muktaha Padam gachantya namayam Padam gachantya namayam Karma jam buddhi yuktahi Palam tyaktva manishinaha Janma bandhavi nir muktaha padam gachantya namayam. So, what he says here is buddhi yukta. Buddhi yukta means the one who is yoked to this karma yoga buddhi. Karma jam palam tyaktva, having dropped the fruit born out of karma. Karma jam phalam tyaktva. Then what happens? Manishinaha, becoming very wise and contemplative. Janma bandha vinir muktaha. They become freed from birth, from the fetters of birth, from the bondage of birth. Gachanti padam. They attain that abode. Which abode? Anamayam, which is free from disease, free from any evil. So what does it say? The wise possessed of knowledge, having abandoned the fruits of their actions and freed from the fetters of birth, go to the state which is beyond all evil. So what happens to someone who's practicing karma yoga? This is what happens. Number one, karma jam palam they are able to let go of the results or the fruits of action. So what does that mean? Because my action is dedicated towards God, I am not in it for joy and sorrow. I'm not in it, uh, you know, I'm not in it because I want to be happy because this will make me happy or definitely I don't engage in something to make me sad, but I'm not in this for joy and sorrow. I'm in it for God. So you get rid of joy and sorrow immediately when your goal is, it's for God. It's for God. So whether joy comes, sorrow comes, it doesn't matter. It's for God. Then what happens in karma yoga, it's very, very clear that it's for my growth. It's very clear that this is an action for my growth because we're looking at the larger picture here. We want liberation. We want moksha. And karma yoga prepares us for moksha. So I'm doing this for my growth. So whether it's success or failure, doesn't matter. I'm going to grow through this action. So again, so what do we drop? We drop success, we drop failure. Because I'm growing. Then what happens is, in karma yoga, the action that we take up is something that's selfless something that's, you know, for, for a community or it's my dharma or something greater. So what happens is my vasanas, my selfish think of vasanas also decrease. 
because I'm not doing it to increase more and more of my ego. I'm actually doing it to reduce my ego. So uh, all that selfishness, it goes away. So what's happening? By, by dedicating it or doing the action for God or Guru, for my growth, for the good of all, what's happening? So many things are happening. I'm not interested in joy or sorrow, what happens. I'm not interested whether I succeed or fail. And I, I'm not interested in selfishness anymore. This disinterest in whether a result comes joyous or sorrowful or success or failure or selfish pursuit, this disinterest in that, that's dropped. That's what we're talking about when the results are dropped. This, this interest in the results, it's dropped. So when the result comes, one is completely equipoise. So buddhi yukta, having understood karma yoga thoroughly, karma yoga thoroughly, and palam karma jam palam tyaktva, letting go of the results because I'm not interested. I've got something higher to pursue. What happens to this person? Manishina. They start to become more contemplative. They start to turn inward. They examine life and they say, gosh, what am I doing? What am I doing in life? What am I doing every single day? What is my purpose? They, they start questioning. They start inquiring. And when they do become these kinds of seekers who question, who inquire, and they gain knowledge, what happens is, Janma Bandha Vinir Muktaha. They gain that knowledge and they are free from this bondage of birth. What do you mean free from this bondage of birth? In the uh, commentary, it says something beautiful. Janma eva bandha. Birth itself is bondage. <laughs> birth itself is bondage. Meaning we know in our lives, no baby ever comes out laughing, right? We have not seen it. Everybody who comes out of the hospital is crying. Why Janma Eva Bandha? Birth itself is bondage. To associate ourselves with anything that's born is bondage. This is what it means. If we think we are born, that's bondage. When we think of ourselves as the body, and the body is born. The body is, you know, it dies. It goes through so many things. That association itself, that is bondage. When we think that we are the mind, we think that we are the mind and the mind is going through so many, many things, so many ups and downs, so many thoughts. That association is bondage. Association with anything that's born is bondage. The body is born at some point. The mind is born every day, right? Every night when we go to sleep, it dissolves every day. The mind is born. Associating ourselves with that is bondage. Associating ourselves with these personalities, our names, who we think we are, our individuality, that's also born. That's something that was born. Right? It, we, we could have been something else in the past lives. In fact, probably we were. So when I associate myself with anything that is born, that is bondage. Because I, the self, am not born. You are what? Any, anything that you can be without means it's not you. If you can be without the body, that's not you. You can be without your mind, that's not you. <laughs> you can be without the ego, that's not you. Whatever you can be without, that's clearly not who you are. Whatever is born, whatever dies, that's clearly not who you are. So here he says, 
जन्म बंधा दिनीर मुक्ता हा means they are free from this notion of associating with anything more. They're free from it because they realize their true selves as Atman. And when they do, kachanti padam, they attain this state, which is free from disease, from evil. What do you mean attain this state? They are already that state. We are already that. It's just discovering it. It's like that key that's in your pocket and you feel like you lost it and you're looking for it all over the place, but it's in your pocket. Like that, all that's needed is for the mind to turn inward to realize who you truly are. And they in fact realize this and they revel in this state. So what this clearly shows is that karma yoga is a beautiful stepping stone. It's a beautiful stepping stone because it brings so much purity. It brings so much purity and it prepares us for jnana yoga. And once we get into jnana yoga and realize who we are, then we are absolutely free. Now, does that mean that this uh, person who realizes the self will not have any pain or will not have any disease. No, remember, Atma, the self, will does not have any pain, does not have any disease, does not have anything. Atma has no qualities. Atma has nothing else except Atma. The body might have it, the mind might have it, but they know that they are not the body or the mind. And they ever revel in that self, which is free from all of this disease. That's what happens. Now the question comes, okay, then how does one know that they're ready for Jnana Yoga? Lord Krishna told Arjuna, Arjuna, right now you do Karma Yoga. Do Karma Yoga, engage in your Dharma fully. This is how you do it. This is why Karma Yoga is better than Karma. These are all the benefits of Karma Yoga. But then reading this, one might say, I want to get to Jnana Yoga. Why don't I just get to Jnana Yoga right away? When is one truly ready to gain the knowledge of the self? When exactly does that happen? So now we will see verse number 52. It's a very, very beautiful verse. Um, I got a comment here. The sound is low. Can you all hear well? Yeah? Okay. All right. All right. Verse number 52. Yada te moha kalilam. Yada te moha kalilam. Buddhir vyatita rishyati. Buddhir vyatita rishyati. Tada ganta sinir vedam. Tadaganta sinir vedam. Shrota vyasya shuta syacha. Shrota vyasya shuta syacha. Yada te moha kalilam. Buddhir vyatita rishyati. Tadaganta sinir vedam. Shrota vyasya shuta syacha. So what this verse says, yada, when, te buddhi, when your mind or intellect, vyatitarishyati, crosses over, boha kalilam, this dirt or mire of delusion, tada, then, gantasi nirvedam, or nirvedam gantasi, one attains vairagya or dispassion, from Shrotavyasya, what is to be heard, and Shrutasya, what has been heard already. So what does this mean? When your intellect crosses beyond the mire of delusion, then you shall attain to indifference as to what has been heard and what has yet to be heard. The fruit of Karma Yoga is dispassion. Dispassion Vairagya or Nirveda. They're all the same words. How do I know 
that I have done my karma yoga well. One question, do you feel this dispassion? Because it says when your mind, yada te buddhi, when your mind crosses over this delusion, this dirt of delusion, what is this dirt of delusion? These impurities we have, these likes, dislikes, these selfish vasanas, all of these things, these confusions about our duty, not wanting to do our duty. When the mind crosses over all of that, then we get dispassion. Now, what is this dispassion? You know, many people, uh, when they hear this term, they get afraid. They get afraid because it's, it's called dispassion. So does it mean it's like one is completely indifferent like one doesn't really care about anything. It's a very, very beautiful thing. Dispassion means the absence of desire for the objects of enjoyment here or hereafter. So what happens is the absence of desire. And this absence of desire, it doesn't come because we can't get that desire. So I, I'm sure you all know the story of the, the fox and the sour grapes, right? The fox wanted to try to get these grapes and they were up a tree. And so he tried to get them, but he couldn't get them. So he said, never mind, never mind. The grapes, the grapes are sour, so I don't want them anyway, right? So sometimes we feel like we have vairagya or dispassion but it's really because we couldn't get that thing. <laughs> because we couldn't get that thing. It's not because we're really dispassionate, right? You get somebody who, let's say, wants to buy a really, really nice car. Maybe somebody wants to buy a Tesla. And he goes to the dealer and he realizes that it's a lot of money. So he says, who needs a Tesla anyway? What does a Tesla do? And why is it even, you know, necessary to have one? Starts criticizing it, right? Because he can't get it. That's not Vairagya. That's not what we're talking about. Then there are some people who have this so-called dispassion because they're not allowed to, to do something. So if somebody has diabetes, they'll say, oh no, I can't eat sweets. It's not that they're dispassionate to a seed, it's because they can't eat it. That's not Vairagya. And Vairagya is not certainly you know, some, somebody just trying to force themselves out of something. Like if you take a, uh, um, a mother, you know, let's say she inherited a beautiful necklace. She inherited a beautiful, beautiful necklace. And she loves this necklace and she wears it all the time. And so many people ask her, you know, how long are you going to hold on to this necklace? How long? And she says, you know, it's my necklace. I want to keep it. And she keeps it and she wears it and she holds on to it. And then what happens eventually her son is getting married. And so she has to give something to her daughter-in-law. And whereas before she didn't want to even take out that necklace or give it to anybody, but now she willingly gives the necklace if she likes the daughter-in-law, <laughs> but I'm sure she would. So she willingly gives the necklace. And she lets go. And this giving the necklace, it's so natural. It comes out of maturity, right? She's not forced to give it. She willingly gives it. So when we willingly give something up, that's called vairagya. It's not just giving up. We've grown out of it. We've grown out of it. So we're giving it up. It's not that we're forced to give it up. That's not called vairagya. That's force. Vairagya requires a lot of maturity. That now I'm done with this, take it. I don't need it or let it go. I'm done with it. So a person who's uh, in there, you know, taking charge of their business, holding on to their business, holding on, they're not willing to give it up, not willing to give it up. But at a certain age, hopefully they will also say, I'm done. Now you take over. This growing up happens because we grow towards God and we grow away from the objects. That's called vairagya. 
you grow towards God and you grow away from the objects. And in fact, everything that we do in life is for vairagya and vairagya alone. <laughs> At some point in time, we would want to purchase a really big house. But that big house is going to make you not want a big house again, <laughs> isn't it, right? At some point in time, you're going to have three kids, four kids, or two, one. After having those kids, it's going to make you not want kids again, <laughs> right? Everything in life is there to make you not want it again. Everything in life is to make you grow out of it. If you just see it, that's the purpose of life. It's, it's to grow out of every single thing. It's to grow out of every relationship, out of every experience, out of every space, out of every place. It's to grow out of it because we won't find true joy there. But that growing takes time and maturity. That's why we never force people out of it. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, it will say in chapter three, don't force anybody. They have to develop their own vairagya. And if it's not there, they'll again have to keep going through it and keep going through it until it hits them. So when that maturity, that absence of desire for the world, objects, when that maturity kicks in, that's called vairagya. And that is the fruit of karma yoga. When that, a seeker gets that, then that's it. That is the necessary, one of the most necessary qualifications for jnana yoga. And this vairagya or this passion is for shrotavyasya. It's for what is to be heard or what is to be experienced. And it's towards what already has been experienced. So there's nothing anymore. There's nothing else this mind wants to do. It just wants God. That kind of mind is a ripe mind for Jnana Yoga. Hmm? Then we're ready. Then we're really ready to go deep into it. Now, there's another, uh, there's a twist now to this uh, uh, verse. It's one of those verses which you can take this meaning or that meaning. So I'm going to give you now the other meaning. Okay. So first meaning is clear. Yes. First meaning is in the context of karma yoga. When are we ready? When do we get the results of karma yoga? When do we know we're ready for jnana yoga? when vairagya comes. And this vairagya is what we call apara vairagya. Now, we look at this a little bit deeper. Meaning number two. When, when what happens? Moha, when buddhi, when that mind, vyatitarishyati, crosses over this moha kalilam, this dirt of delusion. This dirt of delusion means this moha of taking the self to be the not self, of taking this atma to be the body, the mind, the intellect, the ego. When this is crossed over, then one attains vairagya. What? What do you mean? So, because taking when when you cross over this delusion of taking the self to be the not self. Meaning when you have that proper knowledge, your proper viveka, proper discrimination, when you cross over that, then you get vairagya. That's a little bit weird. Yes, but that's a different kind of vairagya, which is called para vairagya, supreme vairagya. After knowledge, after one realizes the self, what happens is a different kind of vairagya. It's supreme vairagya. What is this supreme vairagya? Vairagya or appara vairagya, the first kind of vairagya for a seeker, 
is simply I don't want, right? I don't want. I have no desire for it anymore. I don't want. That's called aparavairagya. And this aparavairagya cannot be I don't want that. <laughs> it means I don't want anything. I don't want. Because I want God. Paravairagya means it's not there. It's not there. So what will you want? And who will be there to want? The world is seen as an appearance. And even that ego is seen as an appearance. So who will want what? Who is there to want? And what is there to want? Hmm? So this is a deeper meaning. I'm, I'm showing you both meanings so that you can see how deep the Bhagavad Gita can actually go and how deep dispassion or vairagya can go. And uh, some, some might think that this dispassion, these people will be so sad. Those who are dispassionate and don't want anything in the world, they'll be so sad. They'll be so sad. They are the happiest people in the world. And we will see just how happy they are. This uh, next few verses that are going to come up is just going to paint how happy somebody who has dispassion is. Okay? All right? So this is clear so far? Yeah? Now, going back to the first meaning of uh, Bairagya, what do you do? So you, you perform Karma Yoga. What happens is one gains the purity of mind. Purity of mind is dispassion. It's vairagya. It's the absence of desire from things in the world. Right? And it's, as I said, it's not a forceful one. It's not a selective one. It's a very mature one. What do you do with that vairagya and how do you gain knowledge? So let's see now verse 53. Shruti Viprati Pannate Shruti Viprati Pannate Yadasthasyati Nishchala Yadasthasyati Nishchala Samadhavachala Buddhihi Samadhavachala Buddhihi Tada Yogama Vapsyasi Tada yoga ma vapsyasi. Shruti viprati pannate. Yadasthasyati nishchala. Samadhavachala buddhihi. Tada yoga ma vapsyasi. So what does he say here? He says, Yada, when, te buddhihi. When your buddhi, what happens to it? Shruti vipratipanna, which is, you know, it's perplexed or confused by what it has been, what has been heard. So when your, your buddhi has been confused by what you've heard, but with that buddhi, what, buddhi, what you do? Nishchala sthasyati. You clarify it you make everything very clear then samadha vachala you put that buddhi put that mind and intellect in atma in the self and how does it become achala means very very steady you put that mind steadily in the self then tada yogam avapsya see you shall attain this realization. Yogam here means realization. So when your intellect, although perplexed by what you have heard, it stands immovable and steady in the self, then you shall attain self-realization. So what is this self-realization? You know, everybody asks about self-realization, self-realization. What are the steps to self-realization? How does one attain it? When does it happen? So first of all, the most important thing to understand is we are already free. 
Even if we don't know we are free, we are already free. This whole process is just because we think we are not free. So when there's this notion that comes, I think I am not free, I feel bound, then one has to go through this whole system. But when one understands that one is already free, then a very different kind of teaching is given. So I am bound, I need to be free. What do I do? Step one, karma yoga. Perform duties to perfection, as perfectly as possible with that uh, dip formula. Dip yourselves into karma yoga. Dip yourselves into action without getting bound. Step number two. After one does that, what happens is this dispassion or vairagya. Take this dispassion and go and listen to scriptures. So Shruti Vipratipanna means you're going to listen to scriptures. And when one listens to scriptures, there's so many things. There's so many things that the scriptures can tell us. There's so many different schools of philosophy. There's so many different paths. There's so many different teachings. So the first step is that Shravanam, listen to the scriptures, but Nishchalas thasyati means make sure everything is clear. What do you mean make sure everything is clear? Make sure that we understand the underlying message of the scripture. So the whole entire scripture, we take all of the Vedas. All of the Vedas, what is their central theme? The Upanishad. What is the central theme of the Upanishad? The Mahavakya. What does the Mahavakya say? You are Brahman. You are eternal, pure consciousness. You are the source of bliss. You are changeless. That's the central message. So whatever it is that one has listened to, whatever it is that one has read, come to this central message. This is the message. You are truth. You are eternal. So remove all of those confusions. Now, once you get to this, how am I Brahman? How could I actually be that self? So this sthasyati nishchala means reflect, do manana. So the first shruti means shravana. Sthasyati nishchala means manana. Reflect on it deeply. Do I truly understand that I am beyond this body? or I'm beyond this mind? Do I really, truly understand it? And if there are doubts, what are the doubts? This is very important because sometimes we listen to so many things, we read so many things, and then we just passively do it. We just passively do it without resolving what our doubts are. And when our doubts are not resolved, there's no nishchalata, there's no firmness, there's no clarity. So all those doubts have to be removed. If there's anything lingering, remove it. Seek help. Take it away. And, and write those doubts down. Write them down and hold on to it until you clear it. Don't just let it go. Seeking gets intense when we hold the question, stick with the question, and then finally the answer is revealed. That's how seeking gets intense. Seeking doesn't get intense when we listen to so many things. Seeking gets intense when we listen to something, hold it so deeply and reflect upon it and make it part of us. That's how to intensely seek. And if we intensely seek, one word is enough. We don't need so many things. So stasyati nishchala is clarify it. Be very firm in it. That's manana. It should be an unshakable knowledge. Samadhau achala buddhi. Then I said, as I said, samadhau, samadhi here means atma. Then the next step is nididhyasana. Nididhyasana means now place that mind in atma 
place it in Atma and Achala. Don't let it go here and there. Single pointedly place it in Atma. What do you mean place your mind in Atma? Are you physically placing the mind in Atma? No. What we mean is absorb the mind in the knowledge of the self. Dididhyasanam means once we're very clear about this knowledge, we're not shaking anymore. Nishchala means we're not shaking, right? Achala means, again, not moving. Stay steady. Absorb it in that knowledge. Contemplate on it. Uh, the best way to do Nididhyasana is to just sit quietly with that thought. Just sit quietly with that thought and let all your thoughts just become that one thought and flow in that direction. But Nididhyasana can also be practiced when one is walking when one is sitting, watching something, when one is in nature. It can be practiced in so many different ways. But the main premise of it is to just hold all the thoughts to that knowledge, direct it towards that knowledge, so that we can abide in it. We can make ourselves part and parcel, that knowledge, we can make that knowledge part and parcel of who we are. And when we do this, tada yogam avapsyasi, then that realization or what we call a paruksha jnana is attained. So one has to go through in, in, in the light of the Gita as we are studying in chapter two, karma yoga, which brings about vairagya, then shravanam, mananam, nididhyasanam, and that state is attained. Now, again, I'm repeating that we are already that state. The attainment is knowing that we are ever that state. It's not becoming something. It's realizing what we always are. And this is the whole process. And that's why chapter two is a summary of the whole Gita, because it tells us about this process very clearly and in depth. Now, Arjuna says, Arjuna is, is so excited. He's so incredibly excited with hearing all of this from Lord Krishna that he wants to see who is this? Who is such a person who has realized the truth? You know, whenever this, this, it, with this self-realization comes up. We always wonder who's the example, who can we look up to, you know, who can we see? Because it's inspiring, right? Siddhasya lakshanani sadhakasya sadhanani. The indicators of people who abide in this knowledge are sadhana, are pointers of sadhana for us, for us seekers. So siddhasya lakshanani, the indicators of those who are established are sadhakasya sadhana, are pointers of sadhana for the sadhaka, for us. So Arjuna wants to see who is this person like? What is this person made of? How do they speak? How do they sit? How do they eat? How do they stand? He wants to know the whole story of what this person is. And this portion we're coming to is called stita pragnya lakshana. And it is one of the most beautiful portions of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's something that we all have to memorize. Huh? So we will keep chanting and chanting and chanting the Stita Pragna Lakshana because it will teach us how to live life. So the first point before we enter this, Stita Pragna. What does Stita Pragna mean? Stita Pragna means Pragna means wisdom is stita, it's steady. The wisdom is steady. So we are studying a person whose wisdom is steady. That means there's also a person whose wisdom is not steady. Astita pragna, right? And that could be us. Our wisdom is astita. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. Sometimes we remember, sometimes we forget. Sometimes it's really deep, sometimes it just flows over our head. And this is what happens in the beginning. 
But for them, it is stita. It's stita. Why is it stita? What makes it so firm in them? Number one is their absolute clarity. So there's absolute clarity in this knowledge. As we said, that sta siyati nishchala, it's so clear. It's so clear that they can't be shaken. Number two, there's a lot of sadhana that they did. They did not become so steady just like that. Very often when we see the lives of our saints and sages, we don't see how much sadhana they actually performed. They did a lot. There was so much, so much in the backstory that sometimes we don't see it. So we don't know it, but it's there because it takes that much sadhana. If not in this life, then in previous lives. It's not something that just happens overnight. It happens in time. Number three, for them, the qualities that we will see, the things that we will see, they're effortless. They do not even have to make an effort to be the way they are. They just are like that. In fact, they cannot help but be like that. And that's the glory, that's the beauty, because they're not even trying. They're not even trying to look good or to be good or to, you know, to make themselves like anything. They just are like that. This is the glory of Stita Pragnya. And now one might say, Guruji always warns us. And he says, now don't, you know, go through this uh, chapter and then look, is this person Sita Pragya? Is that person Sita Pragya? He says, this is not for us to look at everybody else and say, oh, are they Sita Pragya or not? It's for, to look at ourselves, to look at ourselves and to see how we can grow and how we can become better. Because, the, there, you know, so, there's somewhere it says that Brahman is easy enough to comprehend but a stita pragna, very difficult. <laughs> we cannot comprehend them. Cannot comprehend them. Sometimes they're like a child. Sometimes they're like a madman. Sometimes they're like a ghost. This comes in Pajagovanam. So we cannot comprehend the stita pragna. So this is not for us to go judge outside and see who's stita pragna or not. It's for us to really see inside what we need to do to achieve this Stirata, this steadiness in our knowledge. Okay, so now let's see the question that Arjuna asks uh, Lord Krishna. We will just read it as a teaser. And then, you know, next week we will really get into these beautiful, this is one of my favorite parts of the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna Uvacha. Arjuna Uvacha. Sita Pragnasya ka bhasha. Sita Pragnasya ka bhasha. Samadhistasya keshava. Samadhistasya keshava. Sita dhikim prabhasheta. Sita dhikim prabhasheta. Kima sita prajeta kim. Kima sita vrajeta kim. Arjuna uvacha. Stita pragnasya ka bhasha. Samadhistasya keshava. Stita dihkim prabhasheta. Kima sita vrajeta kim. So Arjuna now asks, I want to see this person who you've been speaking about. Who is the one who has realized the self? What do they look like? Well, how are they? So he asked, Stita Pragnasya, of the one who has steady wisdom, Stita Pragnasya, Gabhasha. What is the description of that person? Samadhistasya, of the one who is merged in Samadhi. O Keshava, Stita Dihi. Again, the one who is of steady wisdom. Kim Prabhasheta. How do they speak? Kimasita. 
how do they sit? Vrajeta, how do they walk? Kim. What, O Keshava, is the description of him who has steady wisdom, who is merged in the superconscious state? How does one of steady wisdom speak? How does he sit? How does he walk? So this we will take up next week. We will get into these verses. Today, I'm just going to summarize what we have done so it becomes clear. And then uh, yeah, from next week, we can enjoy these beautiful qualities. So today, we started from verse number 51. And in verse 51, it said that uh, what happens with Karma Yoga is this Buddhi Yukta being endowed or with this knowledge of karma yoga, they're able to let go of the fruits of action. So remember, all these pairs of opposites, again, they're disinterested. Joy, sorrow, success, failure, selfishness, all disinterested, not, not focused on that. And when there's that disinterest in it, a person becomes more uh, inward. They turn inward, they become more reflective and contemplative, and therefore, they, they realize who they are. They realize that they have nothing to do with anything that's born. That birth itself is a bondage. Associating with anything that's born is a bondage. And so they are free from that. And they realize that they are Atman, the self, which is free from disease, free from pain, free from all of that. And they live their lives beautifully. The question comes is, how does, so Arjuna wants to reach that state. So how do you get there? How do I know how much karma yoga I have to do? When is it done? When is my karma yoga over? When nirvedam comes, when vairagya or dispassion dawns, then that person is ripe to come to jnana yoga. And that dispassion is an absence of desire for this world and hereafter. Anything that has been experienced, anything to be experienced. And that dispassion is out of a sense of maturity, not out of force. Because everything we grow, everything in life is really for us to grow out of it. No, nothing in life is meant to stay. No relationship, no experience is meant to stay. It's meant for us to say, okay, enough. Now I want something else. And so when this dispassion grows, what happens? One is ready for Jnana Yoga. What is Jnana Yoga? Jnana Yoga is Shravana Mananam Nididhyasana. It's those three key elements. When one has heard the essence of the scriptures, understood that that's the essence, and clearly reflects upon it, removes all doubts, and is able to flawlessly just contemplate on it. Just, just keep the mind on it keep the mind in this knowledge, in this teaching, then realization dawns. And that nature of realization is that we are always free. It's not that we became free, but we are always free. And therefore, Arjuna gets very excited by all of this and he wants to see who is a person of realization. How are they in this world? So this is where we stop today. Next week, we will start the verses on Stita Pragna Lakshana. Okay, so I'll say the closing prayer. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nath Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om